Don't you hate it when you're waiting for the bus, probably in the pouring rain, and it blows right past you because it's too full? Well, how about when it passes you, not because it's too full, but because of COVID restrictions? Hard to, you know, wait and trying to get to work on time. And speaking of that, let's talk some more about our seemingly arbitrary 70% benchmark to reopen, since you all had a lot to say about what I had to say. Also, I know everyone tells you not to eat a poppy seed muffin before a drug test, but you also might want to think twice about that pork burrito. Here's the story. They may take our lives, but they may not take our pork burritos. I'm Dan Haggerty. Hi, welcome to the story. Um, so we're going to talk about a lot tonight, pork burritos and otherwise, especially that 70% thing that the state is waiting to hit. I want to hear what you think about it. So please use all the information you see at the bottom of your screen. Use that email, the story at kgw.com, and, uh, and, and hit me up on Twitter. Use the hashtag HeyDan. Now, listen, there are a lot of things that can derail the efforts of an Olympic hopeful. We got the games, they're over a month away now, so they're coming up quickly. Many athletes are getting ready for their trials. They do those in Eugene for track and field, uh, trying to get a spot on Team USA. It's a very tense time, but there is one runner who it looks like is not going to be joining the team in Tokyo, all because she says of a burrito that she ate from a food cart in Beaverton. Now, I've had some negative burrito incidents before, but but nothing like this. Shelby Houlihan is an Olympic runner who trains with Nike's Bowerman Track Club. She went to the Olympics in 2016, so she is good. She holds American records for middle distance running, but now she is banned from the sport for the next four years. See, back in December, she tested positive for this chemical called nandrolone. It is an anabolic steroid of testosterone, so you know it increases muscle mass, and it's banned in sports because of that. But Houlihan says she wasn't doping, she was snacking and that a pork burrito triggered a false positive. In the following five days after being notified, I put together a food log of everything that I consumed the week of that December 15 test. We concluded that the most likely explanation was a burrito purchased and consumed approximately 10 hours before that drug test from an authentic Mexican food truck that happens to serve pig offal near my house in Beaverton, Oregon. Okay, so for the record, I've never heard of anything like this. I eat a ton of burritos, and in my experience, they've kind of had the opposite effect of anabolic steroids, like the exact opposite. But it turns out there have been studies that have looked into this very thing. One study from 2002 actually concluded that the consumption of pork meat, specifically the liver of uncastrated males, can trigger a positive test for nandrolone. Another study from 2015 found the same thing, they actually warned about false positives for Olympic athletes. The World Anti-Doping -Anti Agency actually issued a statement in 2011 urging athletes to use caution when consuming meat, especially when they're in Mexico and some other countries. Holohan says she is not a cheater, that she's never even heard of nandrolone before, and that she tried her best to prove that. I did everything I could to prove my innocence. I passed a polygraph test. I had my hair sampled by one of the world's foremost toxicologists. But I agreed that test proved that there was no buildup of this substance in my body, which there would have been if I had to, had been taking it regularly. Nothing. You see, she's devastated. I mean, she looks so upset in that. You know, as for Holahan, she she has to sit out of the Tokyo Olympics, and it's a four-year ban, right? So if it's upheld, you know, the Olympics were postponed a year. So it actually disqualifies her, or would disqualify her, to compete in the 2024 Games, too. So that would make her 35 years old before she can compete in the Olympics again. Devastating. In the meantime, I'm also learning that my carnitas burrito could contain the livers of uncastrated male pigs. It's not, not necessarily a deal breaker. Now, let's turn to our big story. Now, we spent a lot of time on this show talking about the protesters in Portland being arrested, being charged with different crimes, including last night when we looked at all the cases the DA is currently pursuing. But then I got this email from Lowen. Hey, Dan, what about the dozens of illegal actions by local and federal police that we saw occurring live on TV? Have those been investigated and prosecuted? Well, we do know that the city's independent police review agency and PPB's internal affairs, they are investigating a total of 125 cases of misconduct by Portland police officers at the protest. But those are kind of like HR investigations. Those are not criminal investigations. However, today, 
a Portland police officer was charged for what you see here for his actions during a protest last summer. A grand jury indicted officer Corey Budworth with a single count of fourth degree assault, a misdemeanor. Video here of a protest. This was August 18th. Shows the officer knock a woman down to the ground and then hit her again on the head with a baton as she was on the ground. The woman, later identified as an independent journalist, sued the city of Portland in federal court. The city settled that case for $50,000. Now, I want to bring in Kyla Boshi. When I first read about this story, I thought that I was thinking to myself, is this the very first time that an officer has been charged for something that happened during these protests? But that's not the case, is it? Right. There have actually been two officers now facing charges in connection to these protests. Back in October, a grand jury indicted an officer recently retired for misconduct and other charges. He's accused of using a van to hit a suspect who was involved in a vandalism of a local business. That case is still pending. All right. So we saw the video. The, we've heard the accusations. We know what the independent journalist is saying, but what are we hearing from the police side of things? What's the union saying? So the union is pushing back strong. They issued a lengthy statement today, basically saying the officer did nothing wrong. They also think this is really political. Additionally, they described the events of that night as really being chaotic and police had their hands full. Uh, they declared a riot after someone threw a Molotov cocktail at the Multnomah County building. And so they had their hands full. But again, they say this officer didn't do anything wrong. Where do we go from here? What, where is the case currently and what's, what's next? Right, so the officer has been indicted, single count, misdemeanor. He'll be arraigned at some point. That has not been scheduled with the courts yet, and then we'll see how it plays out. Got it. Kyle Boshi, thank you. Meantime, I'd like to get to this question from NOLA. I've been wondering how many of the protesters are actually from Portland. So we've gotten a variety of these types of questions over the over the, the past year, really. And there seemed to be some line of thinking that people were coming to Portland from other places, maybe even other states, just to wreak havoc here in our city. Now, we don't have the time or the resources to track down every single person who has been to one of these protests and ask them, hey, where are you from? I don't, I don't even think that's possible. But what we could do is take a look at some of the court cases where people have been arrested. And Last night we told you that nine protest cases have been resolved at this point, meaning a person was convicted or pleaded guilty. There's also 200 other cases still in the works, but of those nine, six of the people charged have addresses in Portland. One lives in Oregon City, another lives in the city of Clackamas, and the last lives in North Plains. So of that group, that nine that's actually been convicted, convicted they're all pretty local to the metro area. There was another case that's gotten a lot of attention involving a protester who did travel here from out of state. This man, Malik Muhammad, lives in Indiana, but his mother told us he came to Portland specifically to participate in the protest last year. And he's accused of that right there, throwing a Molotov cocktail at officers. He was charged with attempted murder and a bunch of other counts in April. Police arrested him in Indiana, but a few weeks ago, a bail funding group raised enough money to get him out of jail, but not for long because the feds then hit him with explosives charges, so he was arrested again. Now, there are a lot of people in Portland who ride the bus. You know this. Some people ride the bus because they want to. Some people ride the bus because it means one less car polluting our environment. And some people ride the bus because they have to. It's how they get around. It's how they get to work or to the store or to the doctor. And TriMet wants to keep all of those people safe from COVID. So they don't fill their buses to capacity. They let people kind of be spaced out in there. Now, this wasn't a problem when people weren't going anywhere, when they were staying at home, when everybody was stuck there. But as people get vaccinated, get back to normal life in some ways, get back to work, some people are now being left on the curb. Galen Etlin looks at the restrictions and if they're going to change. Masks are required to be worn at all times while riding TriMet. As Oregon nears 70% vaccination status against COVID-19, things are reopening, people are headed back to work, and TriMet ridership is finally rising again. And I know everybody's out there getting their shots, I got mine. David Allen takes the max for work, but says COVID has sometimes meant delays and maxed out passenger capacity. Hard to, you know, wait and try to get to work on time. Despite lowering risk levels across the Portland metro area, TriMet still has to follow state capacity restrictions. Buses can have under 24 people, max train cars under 26, and west trains under 37. But TriMet says weekly ridership in May increased by 46 percent compared to 2020. There's a lot of people in the mornings I've seen. That means wait times could increase when capacity is full, so some riders are working around the system. I do my best to try and leave early all the time. I pinpoint when it's going to come and then I have an app on my phone. TriMet says these lines are the most impacted by longer waits because of capacity. 
the 6 on MLK, the 20 on Burnside and Stark, the 57 to TV Highway Forest Grove, and the 72 on Killingsworth and 82nd. But overall ridership is still down 53% compared to this time pre-pandemic. Across the country, other major public transit systems have already dropped capacity limits, like here in Minneapolis. Back home, though, Governor Kate Brown's office says until Oregon reaches 70 percent adult vaccination, TriMet and other transit systems will have to follow restrictions. For passengers like David Allen, who need transit for work and essential tasks, he hopes that's soon. It's like get back together before we get to just, you know, go back to normal. Galen Etlin, KGW News. So Oregon is going the conservative route with buses. In fact, in terms of COVID, Oregon's been kind of the most conservative state, one of them in the country, which is not a sentence you can accurately say very often. Some of you apparently think that I've been doing a little of the same. Scott Weaver tweeted me and said, you went all Sean Hannity tonight while whining about our 70% vaccination target. Well, to quote Hannity, if someone's not attacking you, that means you're not doing your job effectively. Yeah, I know that doesn't make a ton of sense and I don't watch a ton of, of, of Hannity, but if he said that there is no logical reason to postpone reopening until Oregon hits this arbitrary 70% goal, well then, okay, I'm confidently all Hannity on this topic. And so apparently is the state of California, an entire state of Hannity's. Starting today, California is back open. There are no more state rules on social distancing, no more limits at restaurants, bars, supermarkets, gyms, stadiums, or anywhere else. And California isn't the only state Hannity. In fact, most of the country has. Everyone is open, everyone, except for five states. And all five states have completely different metrics to reopening. Shocking, I know. Oregon is waiting until 70% of adults have at least one shot. Washington will reopen by June 30th or sooner if 70% of people 16 and older get at least one shot. New Mexico will reopen when 60% of eligible people get fully vaccinated. So both shots. Michigan is going to open on July 1st, no matter what, and Hawaii has varying restrictions on every island. So considering we're just making these rules up as we go along, why not change our goal from 70% to 68% and open up for breakfast tomorrow? Susu15 wrote me on Twitter and said, what's the difference between 68 and 70%? 2%. That is a huge amount of people. Goals must be set. And I agree, but let's not be confused about the actual goal. The goal is to get people vaccinated. That's the goal. The 70% metric was only an incentive and it's time to rethink its effectiveness. I look at it like this. Vaccination rates are plummeting and not because the vaccine is hard to get. If you want the vaccine, it's never been easier to get the vaccine. Now look, I understand there are people out there who want it and can't get it, and the state should continue to work on ways to get those people the shot. But I don't see why that means bars can't reopen. If you're not vaccinated, and you want to be vaccinated, and you don't wanna risk your health until you are vaccinated, it's pretty simple, don't go to bars. Why are we still punishing businesses and the families that run them because of gaps in our rollout plan or people who refuse to get the vaccine? There are millions of people in this state who are fully vaccinated, millions, people who can safely do anything they want and not worry about COVID. So let them, or at least explain why you're not. We have been at this for more than a year. We know how to protect ourselves. Doctors are better at treating it. Our most vulnerable people, 65 and older, are vaccinated at over 85%. I mean, look, keep incentivizing. Do it, give away 100 bucks, keep doing lotteries, try joints for jabs if you want to, but stop holding the economy hostage as we wait to hit a metric that we made up because the CDC found it to be an attainable goal for the nation, not for Oregon, and its businesses. So with that, why don't we count some vaccines? According to the CDC, 2.4 million Oregonians have gotten at least their first dose, and that works out to be 68% of the state's adult population. The governor says when we hit 70%, the state can fully reopen, but we still need more than 65,000 people to get vaccinated to hit that. 
In Washington, the state is reporting 4.1 million people with at least their first dose, and that's a little more than 67% of the state's 16 and older population. Again, that's the metric they are using. They're also aiming for that 70%, but the governor again says they're going to reopen at the end of the month, no matter what. Four in 10 Oregonians apparently believe America needs to, quote, protect and preserve its white European heritage, which is kind of a big talking point for white supremacy groups. We wanted to understand Oregonians' feelings toward white nationalism, anti-democratic movements, protest and democracy more broadly. When the story continues. Somebody emailed me and said, I'm going overboard with my 70% take, told me to breathe. I agree with the second part. I should breathe more, but uh, no way, no way. Businesses are, are half open. People are struggling a lot to keep their, their families afloat right now and their businesses afloat. So no, I, I don't agree with that. I think it's, it's really important and that we should pay close attention to it. Uh, and I'm, I'm curious to hear what you think. Uh, honestly, about the 70% metric, let me know. Use that hashtag, hey Dan, I continue to check these things throughout the show and I'll address a few at the end. I also remind everybody about our Hey Help campaign. This is something we're really proud of and this week we're asking you to consider some donations to the YWCA's Family Preservation Project. This helps to support families involved in the criminal justice system, including children of incarcerated parents, mothers who are in prison, and caregivers. Okay, the program coordinates visits between families. It provides mentoring situations. It helps these families after they leave the prison system. I mean, think about the benefit that something like this does for children who, who have to see their parents incarcerated and the struggles that they have to deal with when they come out. Anything to make that easier is going to benefit our entire community. So if you'd like to donate, just open the camera on your phone, pointed at the QR code on your screen. It's going to take you to a link to donate. You can also go to kgw.com slash heyhelp if you don't uh, have one of those camera phones that works that way. Again, while you're on the page, click 
this drop down menu select family preservation project we're calling this a micro donation drive so feel free to give any amount of money no matter how small it is it all really really helps I promise you and each week we're highlighting a different nonprofit I know so many of you have been sending in great organizations to us we look through uh, all of them we vet all of them we consider all of them so please keep them coming email us to the story at kgw.com now, a lot of times on this show, we recommend things that we think are worth your time, like an, like an article, maybe from another news outlet, or maybe a documentary we think is worth watching. We also love to, uh, when you share kind of those things with us as well, like we got an email recently from a viewer that goes by C, and it says, hey Dan, I came across this article recently in the Statesman, in the Statesman Journal, and I thought it was an interesting read always knew that Oregon was and continues to be a racist state no matter where one lived. Glad to see some real data on how much bigotry lies under the surface. Now here is the data that C is talking about. You can see the headline there. Four in ten Oregonians agree with core white nationalist arguments survey reveals. The Statesman Journal, they published this story on a new survey that found 40% of Oregonians agree with statements like, the, uh, like America must, quote, protect and preserve its white European heritage. That's up nine percentage points from when the same survey was done in 2018. It also found that a number of Oregonians agree with America protecting its multicultural heritage has dropped in the last three years. This survey was commissioned by the Western States Center. They're a nonprofit group that they say they promote inclusivity and democracy. And I talked to the deputy director there about the results of this survey and what she thinks we should take from it. Can you give me some examples of a white nationalist argument that this three and some change percent or four out of ten Oregonians agreed with? Certainly. So I'll, I'll start by just saying a little bit uh, more about white nationalism and, and how, you know, how we characterize it at Western State Center. We really see white nationalism as a bigoted social movement that seeks to create a white only ethno state in the United States. Its supporters seek to build political power um, and, you know, often look to implement extreme racist, anti-immigrant, anti-Muslim policy. White nationalists and the, the closely aligned broader alt-right coalition often have deeply anti-government ideologies, um, as well as um, anti-Semitic um, ideology, making them a threat to, to, you know, communities and our democratic institutions. And uh, two of the, the statements that we saw that um, that four in 10 agreement level from Oregonians that align with, with white nationalist discourse um, wars protect and preserve its white European heritage and that white people in America face discrimination and unfair treatment on the basis of race. Those are, those are, um, you know, tropes and, and harmful talking points from the white nationalist movement that we saw, um, some level of agreement among close to 40% of Oregonians. What is your takeaway? What, what should the average Oregonian take away from this type of study? Sure. I think the data shows us the scale of work that needs to be done, right, to, to protect inclusive democracy and make it more equitable. The vulnerability that many Americans um, have to, to white nationalists and bigoted messaging, as well as a, a fair amount of hope, right, that the majority of Oregonians clearly believe in racial justice and building a multiracial inclusive democracy. So I think the you know, the survey um, has some warning signals, but is overall affirming about the, um, you know, the shared values that the majority of Oregonians have around protecting democratic institutions and, um, and building equitable societies. Now, we've talked a lot about Oregon's racist roots on this show. Sometimes I think people think we're, we're like degrading the state or something like that. We're not. We're just looking at the history of the state, how it was founded, some of the things that, that are laying the roots of our community, including the black exclusion laws. The state's original constitution literally wrote in that it blacked ban it, it, uh, banned black people from living in this state. The rise of the KKK, also in Oregon, in the early 20th century. You can check out a lot of our coverage on the KGW YouTube channel. All right, keep sending in your questions, your comments, your critiques. I'm going to read a few when we finish the story. Next.
All right, hey, we got a comment from Lauren saying, hey, Dan, you know you were misrepresenting this survey, right? The one we just ran in the last, uh, right before the commercial there. 603 people is not a significant enough amount of people. That's how many. They, they, I don't remember if it was 603, but it was around 600 and, and so people that they used to conduct this survey. It is disturbing, they say, but it's, it isn't valuable as a gauge for Oregon. A little disappointed. So, um, you know what? We have some more, some more information, more specific data. Let me go through there. Maybe we'll put something together a little later this week to go a little bit deeper into that study and, and try and dissect it a little bit more. But thank you for the comment. I appreciate it. It'll drive our reporting. As far as uh, the people on my 70%, getting a lot of emails tonight, a lot. And I think some people who agreed with me decided to watch tonight. A lot of people last night were like, Dan, you're uh, Dan. But tonight I'm getting some, hey, Dan, Dan, Dan. So, you know, it's always this or this. You never know. Um, keep them coming. I want to hear what you have to say. Give me some complex thoughts on it because it's really your emails, your thoughts that often get our conversations going in the newsroom and on the story team to continue to drive our coverage. We're nothing without you. I mean that wholeheartedly. Thanks for being with us tonight. We'll see you back here on the story tomorrow.